So what are the incentives to use a bike as one of the main ways you travel? There's a number of reasons, but let's focus on three reasons why we should encourage people to bike more through the planning process. First of all, it's more ecological, and this should be a no-brainer. If you're driving a car, you create greenhouse gases, which are changing our climate. On a bike, none of these things happen, so it's one of the best modes for environment. Biking can also be very social, and this goes beyond those who are part of biking clubs or have friends that bike in groups, but also the interaction at the street level. When individuals travel in a car, they're surrounded by metal and glass. They may see what's on the street, but they have very little interaction. The experience of the individual on a bike or even on foot of the city is a much different one than those in the car. And there's time for socialization, there's time for interaction with all of the various land uses. There is evidence that those who bike and walk spend more time at planning meetings and working with the city to enhance the built environment. As a result, a larger body of social capital is built as we leave our cars. And of course, it's an economic activity. Cars are very expensive. Not only is there the upfront cost of purchasing a car and purchasing insurance for those that do purchase it and the fuel to run the car and the regular maintenance on that vehicle, but we also have holding costs. At least 95% of your car's life is spent parked and you're paying for that parking, whether it's at your house and that space that's occupied on land that you paid for or at a work site where you're paying a daily rate for parking or a monthly rate for parking or someone else is footing that bill or you're driving somewhere else where you have to pay for parking. There's a large cost associated with driving. Biking has a smaller upfront cost. Maintenance is very small relative to owning a personal vehicle, and there's generally no cost to park that bike. It can be a very affordable option for those that are able to use it. So those are the three main arguments we use when we plan for more bike infrastructure and more bikers. So as planners, we focus on how do we get more people biking? And one of the ways we can do this is enhancing safety. The perception of danger is one of the biggest deterrents to biking. So there's a bit of a chicken or egg argument here. Because what we need to enhance the safety of bikers is more people biking. But what we need to get more people biking is more safety. Studies have shown a clear relationship between the number of people biking and the level of safety as a result. The more people that cycle, the safer the streets become for cyclists. And conversely, the fewer the people riding in the community, the more dangerous the cycling becomes. So the primary goal of any cycling program really should be to increase ridership. The probability that a motorist will strike an individual person walking or cycling declines with the negative 0.6 power of the number of persons walking or cycling. And without being overly mathematical, what that means is there's an exponential decrease in the number of people hit by a vehicle with a small increase in the number of people biking or walking. So the most effective strategy for improving cyclist safety is not the conventional approach of requiring helmets and increasing law enforcement, but rather it's finding out ways to entice more non-cyclists to start riding. And the reason that it becomes safer as more people ride is that drivers themselves become more aware of bikers and pedestrians. As drivers are navigating the roads, if they see the one or two occasional cyclists, they don't think much about that cyclist. But as they see more and more cyclists and they become more accustomed to making space and slowing down for them, that becomes a more normal process and individuals become much safer around cyclists and pedestrians. So how do we increase ridership, which will in turn increase safety? One way to do this would be to focus on those who do not ride their bike already. The number one reason that people cite for not riding a bike is simply a lack of access to a bike. So providing better access to bikes, and we'll talk about how to do that in a minute, is one way to get individuals out of their cars and onto bikes for their daily routine. There's been a number of surveys that have asked people why they do or do not ride bikes. Three that are notable come from Amsterdam, Montreal, and Seattle. 
And what they found together is that the distance and danger are some of the top reasons people don't ride their bike. Either the distance to work or to shopping or to socialization is much too far for them to ride as a casual rider, or they perceive the streets to be much too fast moving, too close to cars, and unsafe to use for cycling. Others say they would like to ride with other people on the street, but they can't find friends that are willing to ride or coworkers that are willing to ride with them. They'd rather ride in numbers than alone. And finally, there's always the argument that we can't move to cycling because we must carry too many things to work or we can't get our groceries. There are ways in which all of these things can be accomplished, but it's educating individuals on the options available to them and providing resources to the willing. So what is needed to encourage more cycling? First off, as I said before, cyclists need bikes, and a number of programs can be developed to ensure bike availability at a low cost to individuals. But cyclists also need a place to park their bike. If you're commuting to work and you have to bring your bike up to your office or your cubicle, or you simply have to leave it on the street, that's not a very encouraging process for individuals. So providing safe parking for bikes will encourage more people to use them. On a larger land use issue, ensuring that uses are closer together, whether commercial and residential uses are mixed better, an office is brought closer into higher density residential areas, a reasonable trip distance would reduce the barriers to cycling. And finally, building out the infrastructure necessary for individuals to feel safe when they're biking, particularly those who are more casual cyclists that aren't comfortable biking near fast moving traffic. Let's go back to each one of those and figure out ways in which planning can help alleviate some of those burdens. So working with agencies that can either distribute low cost bikes or fix up old bikes for individuals who may not have them or have them sitting around but don't know how to make them work properly is one way to ensure that people will have bikes. Providing a subsidy at the city level is also a good way to encourage bike use and bike ownership. Adding into building and zoning codes bike parking requirements is also a good way to ensure that people have a place to store their bike at their residential unit or when they get to work or when they go shopping. Building these into zoning codes would be the same way we require a number of parking spots for cars, that we require a number of toilets based on individual occupancy or accessible design, etc. Making this an easy part of the building code it won't be a huge burden to builders, but will be a large encouragement to individuals to use their bike. Bike share programs have also proliferated over the last decade. They've made cycling easier for the more casual rider, where they can hop on and hop off and not worry about where they're gonna keep their bike or how much it'll cost them to purchase and maintain a bicycle. At the city level, ensuring that bike share programs are successful is one way to make sure people will use bikes more. And hotels and workplaces can also offer bikes to those who would normally rent a car and drive through a city. Some cities have also gone an extra step and required that shared bikes be available in new developments. So not only do you build the building itself, but you also have a rack full of bikes that the residents or tenants of that building can use anytime they need a bike. And also, Auckland does a good job of this generally, and other cities have done a great job as well, which is integrating bikes into train systems so that people can use their bike for the first and last mile of their journey. Back to the land use issue of trip distances. In order to encourage bike riding, things need to be at bikeable distances. So trip length is a critical component of the cycle planning process. As a rough guide, clusters of jobs and commercial and residential uses should be within about a 20 minute commute of each other. At a 10 mile per hour pace, that's called a no sweat pace, where the individual can slowly work their way across generally flat land, cyclists have a range of about five kilometers. In places where individuals must travel farther to get to their destination than that five kilometer trip, they should within that five kilometers have access to rapid public transportation on either end of the trip to help facilitate the use of mixed mode trips where biking can be part of that mix. When people think about using a bike, the first thing that comes to mind is how safe am I going to be? 
And often the perception of safety is more important than the actuality of safety itself. It is not necessarily safer in terms of actual crash statistics to ride in a bike lane or cycle track than it is to ride in the middle of the outside travel lane of a major arterial. As we talked about in the last module, paint really is not a real barrier to cars entering bike space. But the perception to a biker is that this is a much safer space than riding on the road. Only the hardiest of cyclists are willing to share the road with high-speed cars and trucks. Providing that extra painted space for bicyclists is one key in encouraging them to bike. So to create many new cyclists, it'll be necessary to provide physical separation between vulnerable cyclists and motor vehicles, and design junctions to prioritize cycling so that it's not left to cyclists to determine when the safest time is to cross an intersection. Generally, by at least including painted lanes as part of the infrastructure planning process, it tells cyclists that they don't have to rely on the goodwill of a potentially distracted driver and that someone is interested in their safety. The way we choose to move around our cities is changing. Deep down inside, most folks just want the freedom of choice. Where they live, where they work, where they eat, and how they get from one place to another. Across the country, more people are choosing bicycles as a way to get around. Half of all trips Americans make are less than four miles, an easy distance to ride by bike. And bike commuting has increased by 53% since 2005. Cities are encouraging this trend by building a new kind of bike lane called a protected bike lane. Protected bike lanes are on street lanes which are separated from motorized traffic by curbs, planters, parked cars, or posts. Since 2011, the number of miles of protected bike lanes has doubled. Protected bike lanes are the solution that makes riding on a street like riding on a trail. So it makes biking an attractive option for a much wider range of people. These projects are about livability, they're about economic success, they're about building community. They're about community happiness. This is just part of a continuing effort to make Memphis a better city, a more livable city, to attract the type of young people and to keep the type of young people that we need. And having these protected bike lanes improves the quality of life in our city, improves the, our economic competitiveness, and it allows us to draw employees, employers, and entrepreneurs. People come here and they're always really refreshed. They see people out riding their bikes. They see protected bike lanes and they understand that we're part of the modern world. Protected bike lanes not only make it easier for people to get to a place, but they can help put a You Are Here stamp on a neighborhood. They can make it a place that you want to go to and be in rather than a place that you're moving through. Obviously, as a business owner, I was a little bit nervous. I was like, okay, let's see how this goes. Um, and I think that there's a major shift happening right now with this project. It's a real missed opportunity, you know, if we don't embrace that. I think protected bicycle lanes, the real value of them is that they benefit everybody and it's not about um, serving cyclists. What we're trying to do is order the streets so that they're easier for everybody to use and so that they're predictable and so that they're comfortable and so that they're safe. On these busy streets, if you create a separated protected place for bikes, drivers know where to expect bicyclists. You know, we've seen speeds of cars come down, we've seen the number of bicyclists go up, uh, and we made it easier to cross the street for pedestrians. A study in New York showed that protected bike lanes reduce traffic crashes for all road users by 34%. When you get a protected lane, you see like families and grandmas and like, you know, people who are just getting around. It's not the, like this crazy, dangerous, insane thing to do. It's just how, how you travel. It's even more important to me to continue to advocate and push for more bike lanes and more bike infrastructure so that my daughter and I have safe places to ride. In a recent study, 96% of people say protected bike lanes make them feel safer on the street. If they could build more of them, I think more families would, would go out and get bikes and, and go out and enjoy it and say, you know, hey, look, we can get to school faster that way, and it's safe, and, and we feel comfortable, and I don't feel, like, unsecure of uh, getting on the road with my kids and, and worrying about them. 
They open up the street to people who might not otherwise feel like they belong there. That green paint to me is like saying like, this is a space for you and you're supposed to feel safe in it. The more people that choose to ride bicycles, the better the quality of life is gonna be in your city, period. A simple way to encourage those to bike that are concerned about biking alone or being non-social as they commute to work each day is to make bikeways that are capable of providing space for bikers to be social. But much of the infrastructure that we have for bicyclists limits them to one abreast. That means biking by yourself and if someone's with you, shouting behind you to try to communicate with them. In order to accommodate two cyclists riding side by side, more dedicated bike infrastructure is required or wider lanes will be needed as we plan bikeways. Some locations ban two abreast ridership, others encourage it. So it's good to take a close look at local ordinances and try to encourage changing the language of those ordinances in order to allow people to ride at least two abreast as they go about their commute. There are two types of cyclists, and in cycle planning, the type of cycling that should be done has been largely debated for 50 to 60 years. One type of cycling is called vehicular cycling, and this is the cyclist that will ride in traffic and follow the same patterns that cars do, such as stopping at all stop signs and stop lights, using signals to indicate where they're going, and generally acting like they are a vehicle on the road. The vehicular cycling camp believes that cyclists should be allowed on all roadway facilities and typically have not been big fans of bike lanes as they feel that it limits the locations where cyclists will be accepted. In the United States, for example, less than 1% of the population is comfortable on all roads, and only 7% is comfortable on typical bike lane conditions. So vehicular cyclists are much lower in number, and they typically are pretty hardcore cyclists, or people who are going to cycle under any conditions. Non-vehicular cycling describes the vast majority of cyclists. These are cyclists that behave more like pedestrians than motorists and they're typically accommodated on paths or cycle tracks and other facilities not shared by high-speed or high-volume motor vehicles. When non-vehicular cyclists use bike lanes, they tend to make a box turn using the crosswalks to cross one street first and then another. About 60% of the population would like to be cyclists but would mostly prefer to ride in a non-vehicular style. In order to accommodate this 60% of the population that would like to cycle, we need a comprehensive network of cycling infrastructure. So this infrastructure itself should be cohesive when planned, and that should be making connections throughout the community. It's all too common that there's good bicycling infrastructure that stops and starts and stops and starts, or narrows and widens. This causes not only confusion for the cyclists, but discourages use as it requires many cyclists to get onto the road and then get back off onto the dedicated facility. We should have direct routes. Rather than requiring cyclists to go around extra blocks or extra miles, it should be the least distance between point A and point B as we direct that flow of traffic. Just like public transportation, it should be clear and understandable how to use biking infrastructure. Not understanding how to use such infrastructure is one of the biggest discouragements to new people joining the cycling movement. And our cycling infrastructure should be integrated with the rest of our built environment. There should be particular care given to intersections and ensuring that cyclists can safely cross boulevards and other large roads without having to run across and hope they can dodge traffic. The cycle infrastructure should be enforced. When we provide protected bike lanes, we should make sure that if a car parks in that lane, they are ticketed or removed promptly so that other motorists will know that this infrastructure is in fact dedicated to bikes. And the infrastructure should be clearly marked, not just for cyclists themselves, but also for motorists. And that marking usually takes the form of wayfinding. And wayfinding is really a series of signs or symbols on the road that are used to demarcate routes and distances to particular destinations and upcoming turns. It makes it clear for both the cyclist and the motorist to reduce the number of potentially dangerous interactions between cars and cyclists. 
More than just providing space for a cyclist, bike lanes and charros should be a guide for cyclists on the most direct routes throughout the city. A colored bike lane can self-identify routes, especially through complex intersections and turns. Adding bike boxes to intersections clearly demarcates where cyclists can queue for intersections and at a minimum providing some green paint for bike lanes at least shows motorists where cyclists are going to be. But the best kind of bike lane is a protected bike lane. At the end of the day, biking and walking are the most ecological, economical, and good city building reinforcing ways to travel. We should do what we can as planners to encourage these modes. While it be overly optimistic to assume that everybody would like to take to their bike or walk, or even replace the majority of their trips with an active travel mode, replacing just one or two of those trips at the individual level can make a huge difference in the level of traffic in the city, the safety for active modes, and the environment for everybody that lives in and interacts with the city.